You know, I remember having a $2 million home sitting in um, Palm Springs I was living in, and I just, I was so unhappy, you know, and I, I had all this, all this stuff, and I was just so unhappy because of this empty void on the inside that I could never fill with the peace that I have today. But I filled it with like all the other things, drugs, sure. sex, you know, women, you know, whatever it was, I was trying to fill that empty void on the inside, and it just never was enough. Really cool man we have daryl strawberry who is without a doubt a baseball legend four world series eight all-star game appearances a nomination to the national baseball hall of fame now that's the highlight reel okay but he also struggled inside of that fame with addictions abuse divorce cancer jail time overdue library books um i'm not sure why your publicist put that in there maybe to soften some of the other stuff uh but you know how do you go from that okay to writing your new book, Turn Your Season Around, How God Transforms Your Life. Well, first, I, I, I need to return those library books. I think that's important. You know what? You, know, you got to make it right. <laughs> got to make it right. I mean, I made amends on all the other things. But um, <laughs> but thanks for having me. It's great to be here with you guys. And, and, and how do you go from that to turn your season around? Yeah. You, you just don't. It's not an overnight miracle that happens in, in a person's life. I, I think what has to happen it comes over a period of time. And you have to uh, really be persistent, and you have to surrender yourself completely to God. And, and that's what it was for me. So everybody looks at my life today, and they think, well, how did you get in this place? Well, I, God set me for seven years before I even was touched after I went through the struggles of life and, and the problems. He set me for seven years in the church to be discipled. I, little did I know that he was calling me to be an evangelist, to travel the country and preach 250 times without any type of education or anything. But he was preparing me. And when he prepared me, I, I, had, I had to go through the process of being disciplined, just like I was in baseball. So sure. it's a process for you to get where God needs you to get. You can't get there by yourself. I tried in many ways, you know, like you read the list of everything uh, that I went through, you know, from the drugs, the alcohol, the women. I mean, the whole lifestyle. And none of that shocked me. It was the library books. That was the <laughs> thing that I really had a hard time wrestling with. I'm like, how would Daryl do that? I uh, forgot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you're right. You struggle through a lot of that stuff. And the thing is, I think a lot of times we want to, like, get our lives all together and then go to God. But I think God works completely counter to that. God's like, come to me with all of that stuff. Is that kind of where you were at? Like, when you hit that place, you're like, I got to make some changes? Well, God is totally opposite than what we are. You know, he, he thinks totally different than we do. And he loves us right where we're at. And because I think the thing that I learned the most about God is he knows that we're all broken pieces. So we, we fool ourselves. We try to fool ourselves. Sure. You know, that we have it all together and, and I could be well. And, and he already knows that you cannot be well without me and without my principles, without my son. There's, it's impossible for you to live uh, the fulfillment of life and the promises over your life that I had for you. So I, I think coming to him with all the broken pieces is like, he's not like, oh, wow, like most human beings are, you know, they're like, oh, wow, you're such a mess, you know, and, <laughs> and, and like. The media, you know, they write about you when you struggle and your downfalls and, and they kick you when you're down. But, you know, as soon as you get up and you have a transformation and you find God, they goes, oh, yeah, here, here we go again. Some, another one found God. You yep. know? But when they realize that you don't live like that anymore and they've seen me for 17 years. I remember when I first started this journey and they were like saying, yeah, well, we'll see how long his life lasts with God. And, you know, it's been 17 years going on, about 18 years doing wow. what God has called me to do in my wife. And it's just a complete honor to who he is. You know, once you actually get into the place of having a relationship with God, it's really cool when you have a relationship with God. I think so many people have relationships with themselves and you have relationships with others. But when you actually get into this place and you have a real relationship with God, it's you and him. It's not about anything else. And now the thing I like about that is because God knows everything about us, and we sometimes don't even know what he has for us, and I think that's what's really cool about it. Yeah, a lot of people talk about like finding God's will for your life. That's a big mystery. And I think that the, the simple answer of that is... If you're serving God wherever you're at, you're in His will, you know, but we always want it to be that thing because we don't know the whole plan, but He's working behind the scenes for our good, even when we don't know it. Do you look back at anything from your 
like time in, in the majors or things like that, and you look back and you see now, oh man, God did have a purpose for this. It didn't feel good at the time. It wasn't good at the time, but it really ultimately ended up working out for his glory. I think my whole career was the whole purpose of it. I think everything that I had to endure and go through and, and suffer, you know, because I think from the fact of my childhood, I was already broken before I ever put the uniform on, you know, because my dad was a raging alcoholic. Sure. And he actually came home, put out a shotgun one night, said he was going to kill a whole family. I was 14 years old, and he used to beat me and my brother. So you think about it, I was already broken before I ever put the uniform on. Brokenness is real. Lawlessness brings about brokenness. Empty uh, families uh, bring about brokenness. And the uniform was a place that God allowed me to go to because it was my pain. My pain led me to my greatness, but my greatness will eventually lead me to my destructive behavior. So I'm, I'm quite sure he, he knew that this whole plan would plan out. I mean, I was multi-talented. I could have went to college to play basketball, but I chose to play baseball. And I go on to play baseball, and I become this phenomenal baseball player in New York under tremendous amount of pressures and expectations. And I go on to win rookie of the year and win – win a championship and become eight-time All-Star and win f four championships out of my career. And I would go on to have all these problems because, you know, the success of the uniform it wasn't, you know, who I was as the person. You know, that was just the success of the talent that I had on the ball field. And how old were you at the time? I was I was in my young, what, 20s? Young 20. First I was, I was 20. Well, 21 when I came to the big leagues. Okay, because I don't know anybody in in your tax bracket like at that age, you know. And I've always contended you get guys coming out of high school, college, and all of a sudden you sign a big multi year contract, multi million dollar contract. You don't know how to handle that, especially if you're coming from a place of a dysfunctional thing, and you're looking for a dysfunctional family and setup. You're looking for anything to fulfill some needs and some holes. Like, did you experience some of that? Like, you got so much so quick. Well, I, it wasn't that I had so much so quick you know what I was experiencing inside is is that I was lonely okay you know and I think you know um, a lot of people think well because you have money and you privilege and you live behind community gates you should be happy yeah. that it didn't make me happy it was just a bunch of stuff you know and I, I think people don't realize that and understand that until you actually are in it you know and 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 then then what's next there, there's nothing next you, you you can't go any higher than you are you know, once you become rich. I mean, I was 21 and I was rookie of the year, 1983. And then I go on to sign a, what, $8 million contract, you know, for the next eight years, you know, to play in New York. Yeah. And, and and then I go on from there and I become a free agent. And I sign a $20 million contract to play in, in Los Angeles. But at the same time, I'm still, I still have this dysfunction inside of me. I mean, I can hit home runs. I can play baseball. Yeah. I could steal bases. I could do all these things. But this dysfunction inside of me, the money never changed the dysfunction. There's such a great emptiness on the inside of every last one of us. And and no one can fill that empty void but God. That's what King Solomon talks about. That's why I love him, you know, because he had everything. And it goes on in the book of Ecclesiastes, and he talks about everything is meaningless under the sun without God. And it really is because you can have all this stuff around you, and all of a sudden you could be sitting around, and it just means nothing. You know, I remember having a $2 million home sitting in um, um, Palm Springs I was living in, and I just, I was so unhappy, you know, and I, I had all this all this stuff, and I was just so unhappy because of this empty void on the inside that I could never fill with the peace that I have today, but I filled it with, like, all the other things, drugs, sure. sex, you know, women, you know, whatever it was, I was trying to fill that empty void on the inside, and it just never was enough And, and until I come to the place that I am today, you know, where I just found completely peace peace because God is more than you could ever imagine or expect once you have that commitment with him. Well, that's what's really hard for people who don't have that sort of fame is, you know, because we idolize people. And so what happens is, is you look at somebody that from the outside has everything you want and you have the multi-million dollar contract, you have the big house, you've got this, you've got this. And then when you're not happy or s sadly, you know, some celebrity takes their own life, it wrecks other people. You're like, well, if they had ev everything that I aspire to and they're not happy, what hope do I have? You know, and so that's why it's great that you have uh, your book, How to Turn Your Season Around, How God Transforms Your Life, because I think that's a message that people need to know is that that the only thing that's going to fill that hole is Jesus. And so is that kind of where you delve into, uh, you spend some time in the book on that? Well, yeah, I mean, that's that's the cool thing about 
writing another book. I, I didn't want to write another book, believe me. And, and I got approached by Zondervan and Andy and, and my wife, and she kept pushing about write, write another book. I goes, why? You know, I get that. I, I already got a New York Times bestseller. I've already done it. You I'm kind of retired. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm retired. You know, I love God. I love ministry. I love helping people. Uh, I want to stay under the radar. You know, I'm not looking for fame. I'm not looking for fortune anymore. Um, I enjoy, you know, the work that I've been called to do, and and, and I go out and do it. So I, I decided to go ahead and write this book because I thought I thought. Well, I did, first of all, I didn't know we would be in a pandemic. Didn't know COVID-19 would be a, a big part of what we all all have been through. And and think about it. The Holy Spirit gave me the title before I even knew that we were going going to go through a season like this. Sure. Turn your season Makes around. Sense. You know, it was like we're all going to have to come out of this turning our season around eventually at some point in some time. And, and the book uh, with my writer, Lee, I didn't want another book about Daryl Strawberry baseball trophies. I wanted a book about how I preach. You know, I preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I preach about transformation. I preach about salvation. I preach about sin. I preach about what kept me away from God. All these things kept me away from God. And they all are real, you know, and I think so many people don't understand that God is such a merciful person and he waits for you regardless of how broken you are, how far you've been down. And, you know, that's what the book really tried to, I want to try to convey to the people. He wants to meet you right where you're at because he met me right where I was at. And it was over a period of time in the process. See, what people don't understand was is, is that God found me in a pit and put me in the pulpit. And I'm not even qualified to be in the pulpit. I played <laughs> Major League Baseball for 17 years and, and won, done all these great things, but I was never qualified to be in the pulpit, but God qualifies the call once he calls you and equips you over a period of time. And this is where I sit today, writing another book. That book is the way I preach. My writer, Lee, had to come out and hear me preach. I said, don't write another book about me just just being a story of my life and everything. I want you to write a book about how the gospel of Jesus Christ has transformed my life and changed me and brought me to a greater understanding why I'm here because I don't want to waste time. I don't want to be a hypocrite no more. Sure. And, you know, I just because we see a lot of that goes on and I just don't want to waste time and I don't want to straddle. I see God don't keep me here if I'm just going to straddle, straddle the fence and waste time. You know, I, I should have been dead a long time ago through my drug addiction. I've had cancer twice, lost my left kidney in my second surgery. So when I get in front of a... I would give you mine, <laughs> but I have kidney stones. Oh, do you? Okay. Yeah, so I don't think you're going to want it. No, I don't want it, dude. I'd oh. rather stay with the one I have. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I, I enjoy being in f- front of a congregation and, and ministering and sharing people, sharing to the people of a miracle that God has done in my life, the miracle that he's waiting to do in your life. And I think a lot of times people think the miracle is money, fame, and this and that. No, it's a a miracle that you probably would never think about that you would need that he would give you. And he gives it to all of us, every last one of us, and that's his grace. Who from your past, alive or dead, would be very shocked to see you writing a book about God transforming your life and how to turn your season around. Who would be like, I can't believe Strawberry wrote this book, you know? Well, probably, well, he probably thought I would. I would one day do what God would, wanted me to do. One of my former teammates, Gary Carter, and, and I kind of wrote something in the book about him because he was a Christian man when he played with us, and he lived a life that was, like, totally different from the rest of us. You know, the rest of us are like a bunch of wild heathens, <laughs> wild animals. You know, here there's one guy over here, and this guy, Gary Carter and Mookie Wilson, is living a life among us as as faith believer, as a man. And Did you, you respect that. it at the time? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I wanted that. Yeah. I wish I could have had that. I was like, man, this this guy's got some real discipline about his life, and his his life was about... I'll go out to dinner with my teammates, but I won't go any further than that. I'm going back home after right. I go out to dinner. You know, I'm going to see you guys at the ballpark the next day. And he did, and he didn't condemn none of us. He knew we were all wild and going out and probably partying. <laughs> he never said anything, but he sees us at the ballpark with this great big smile, and he just loved us. And you appreciate that. You appreciate someone that could actually be a superstar and live his life at the same time in his faith. And, and that's what Gary Carter did, you know. And it, 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 it amazed me that, you know, I, I just 
I, I really wanted that. I really wanted to live that kind of life. I wish I could have lived that kind of life in my career because I could have had such a great greater impact, you know, not that God didn't allow me to have an impact with my story now, but I would have had a greater impact on so many lives that were around at that time because in that in that business, everybody's lost. Sure. You know, because it's money, fame, booze, women, whatever, drugs. It, it's, it's everybody. Everybody's got a mix of something. If you don't have a foundation in your life like Gary Carter and Mookie Wilson did of Jesus Christ, you're bound to fall into something. Yeah, and, and especially when you factor age into that too, young and impressionable, you know, but you're doing it now, you know, like everybody takes a different path, and so now the path that you're on is doing the same thing that he did. It's just years later, you know? Yeah, it's, it's just years later, and, and, and God has given me um, a platform to u- utilize uh, who he is more than anything. Yeah, cause you, 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 but you got to be able to get out of yourself. Sure. You know, I, I think so many of us want God's presence, but we won't crush our ego. We won't let him crush our ego. Yeah, that's a big thing, man. Like I, the, the turning point for me in faith was laying down the fact that God owed me an answer for everything. <laughs> and that was really hard to get past. Like, cause I'm like, you, I can't serve you unless I know what you know, you know, and then, then he's like, no, I, yeah, it's not how this works. <laughs> My ways are not your ways, you know, and that was hard for me. And I had to, I had to let that go. I think pride is a big thing that keeps us from going deeper in our faith. Well, sure. ego keeps you away because ego is a three letter word, right? Yeah. Easing God out. Yeah. So that's what most of us do. We ease God out and we play God ourselves. And what happens when we play God ourselves? We lose. Yeah. You know, and when we allow him to play God and, let him do what he's going to do, eventually he's going to make you into what he created you for. You know, and, and I think that's the surrender part that comes that to so many of us. We don't want to surrender because we like worldly things. Sure. You know, and what we don't understand is the flesh operates in worldly things. The flesh is not, the flesh loves, loves stuff, you know, sinful stuff. But the spirit man, when the spirit man dwells in you, it's supernatural. Now you allow him to control you, operate in a different capacity. And I think that's what so many of us don't know about God. You know, we don't know that the spirit man is so real and it lives, it's alive in us. And it, it allows us to be uh, who we are and it allows us to safeguard ourselves. You know, that was one thing I could never do when I was in the flesh. I couldn't safeguard myself because the flesh would pull me this way, that way, that way, that way, wherever it was at. But now, you know, it can't pull me that way because I don't operate in that. You know, I, I've, you know, I, you actually have to have a transformation, you know, and that was that Romans 12 too. And do not be conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. And you had to, had, had to have the renewing be shifted in such a way. And what renews you? It's the word of God. Sure. You know, more more than anything, because everybody's looking for, to be renewed by something. And it's right there in the book. It's been here forever. The problem with most of us is we just don't pick it up and we don't eat it for ourselves. We want somebody to give it to us. And it, just, it doesn't work like that, you know, because we go to church and stuff like that. We hear a pastor. But do I actually go home and eat on the word for myself so I can have the revelation of it? So working on uh, the sports analogy of turn your season around, what if someone's in a spiritual slump? Okay, so what does that look like for for somebody? How do you recommend? All right, this is you know I'm sure you had like you know batting coaches and playing guys. Hey, you got to break your slump. Got to get out of this slump. Here's what you do. You know what do you do when you're in a spiritual slump? How do you start to break that cycle? I know it. I, I know. Well, first the Bible is very simple for complicated people, which we are. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like playing ball and you're in a batting slump. What do you do? You go back to the fundamentals. There you go. Okay. And that's where uh, it's the same way in the word. You go back to the fundamentals of, of what the word is and what it says. And, and what's the fundamentals? Whatever it tells you, don't do, don't do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's that easy, is it? <laughs> Not, but, but that's but, but it's just it's the same as being in a slump. If you're in a slump as a baseball player, I'm actually doing something wrong. Sure. You know, why am I in a two for 30? Everybody's going to go that. Go to that place. But at the same time, can you not get lost in that? Can you handle yourself to know that, okay, now I got to go back to the fundamentals. Now I got to go back to the basics. Now I got to go back into the cage 
and I got to have soft touch. I don't need nobody pitching to me because I don't need to see how far I'm hitting the ball out of the ballpark because that, that ain't, that ain't going to help me get out of the slump. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, so that means I need to go in the case. I need to work, and I need to get that feel again. I need to get that feel hitting the ball the other way, hitting the ball up the middle. I don't need to pull the ball because I, I know I can pull. But, and, you know, it's fundamentals of doing things. And it's the same thing with a Christian walk. When you get off track, that means you're not studying that means you're not having quiet time for yourself. Yeah. That means you're too busy, you know, in social media, uh, cell phone, internet, uh, places you're not supposed to be. Because, see, the enemy, he's real clever about how he wants to do us. You know, and Jesus made it clear about that in John 10, 10. He talks about it. He said he's come to steal, kill, and destroy. So if he can keep us distracted... He, he's got us. Right. You know, and if he doesn't, if we don't allow yourself to be distracted by him and you allow yourself to stay, um, stay flow of what, what's important in your life, your daily, daily like life, you know, of worshiping God and thanking God, then he can't get in. He slides in when we, when we lose. And it's just like the slump, the slump slides in when I stop doing what I used to do. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> what made you great? You get away from that, and then you hit the slump. Same thing with the spiritual life. Is the thing that connected you to God that first time? We get away from that with every passing year. Sometimes. Yes. And that's that's great advice, and that's what the book is about. Uh, Daryl Strawberry, turn your season around. How God transforms your life. Okay, so let's do this. Let's do high and low. Okay. Okay. I do this with my daughter uh, when she was little. High and low. So we're gonna do this with you. High and low. Baseball high. What was your baseball high? Best best baseball moment? Winning. It just doesn't matter when. It doesn't matter. I mean, I think I believe 1986 was you know the year of winning for us, and I just remember when we clinched the National League East at home, and all the fans poured on the field. That was the, that was the biggest high for me because I because I had watched that so many times. Sure, growing you up dreamed as, about it. Yeah, I bet. as a kid. Yeah, growing up as a kid watching baseball. And you see uh, the fans come on the field. They don't let them come on the field anymore. Yeah. But which was, which was, which was a night that I would never forget because I was playing right field and I couldn't run in. I had to run through the bullpen and watch from there behind the glass and see all the people on the field and see the fans going crazy and the excitement uh, of what we brought to those fans. The dog piles always terrified me uh, as a kid because I'm kind of a considerably amount uh, shorter than you, yeah. and I would never want to be on the bottom of that. Well, yeah, you, you'd probably probably would yeah. never get. Yeah. yeah, I would be dead. Yeah, you'd be dead. Yeah, they would crush you. Absolutely, and I appreciate you bringing that up like so so uh, poignantly. Thank you. Uh, uh, baseball low then. What was your baseball low? My baseball low was probably leaving New York and, and going to California as a free agent. Oh, really? Nothing personal against, you know, the Dodgers. I just, you know, New York, I was a New York player, and I got used to the New York fans, and it was just a little bit different when I went sure. to California. It was a little bit more laid back, and I I, I mean, I played there going in there as a as, as a visiting player, but, I, but playing there and, and seeing the difference of, what it was like in New York, because New York fans, they come early and never leave. LA f- <laughs> and they tell you what you do wrong. <laughs> they, yeah. <laughs> they tell you what you've done wrong. They stand over the dugout and tell me, Strawberry, you suck. And I'll be like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> I know where your family lives. <laughs> like, it's a, it's a rough crowd. It's a, it's a tough crowd, man. And, you know, and, and that was one of the lows of, uh, of going and going to a different place to play baseball. And the fans were laid back in L.A. They're just more into, like, the Hollywood scene and, you know, um, sure. you know the Lakers and stuff like that. Yeah. And, and I understand, you know, and, and the Dodgers were great. The Dodgers organization great, and, and L.A.'s great, too. But it was just a little, little bit, a lot different than what I used to play in New York. I got you. Personal high. Personal high, yeah. I think, uh, more of as my kids. Okay. You know, that's a real personal high for me. How many uh, kids do you have? I have six. Holy And my cow. wife has three, so we have nine. Oh, my goodness. So we have a blended family, and we have a, we have a beautiful, blessed family, which, which our kids – uh, all love each other. That's good. Because you can have families where they, you know, there's division and yeah. we don't have that and stuff. And and that's the personal high is my kids. And the reason why I say my kids is because they they were more pr- privileged than I was growing up. You know, they they never been to public schools and they never lived in like a two bedroom like I did. Yeah. You know, <laughs> house or anything. Dad and, never had a shotgun on Christmas. Yeah, exactly. You know, they they never they never seen craziness and stuff like that they they were young when i was crazy yeah so they missed all of that and 
And I'm really grateful for them because they never got into, you know, heavy drinking or drugs or anything. Because, you know, a lot of times when you have a dysfunction and, and broken family and it happens like that, it, 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 it affects a lot of people in the family. So my kids have really been blessed. They've, you know, they've all, all went to like the D1 schools and they've graduated and got, you know, you know, education and stuff like that. And you know, I got my youngest one right now at Boston College. You know, she's a junior, and so nice. and I'm just really proud of them. That's that's really one of my highs. You know, to see because I always ask them, "What is college like?" You know, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Daddy just came out and made millions, yeah. so I have no idea what this college is like. <laughs> yeah, they were like, "Dad, I would love to be like you." Know, I was like, "No, what is what is college really yeah. like?" You know, and it's like. And they was like, it's fun, you know, and that's like, I can imagine, you know, being around your friends and, and going through that whole uh, uh, process and everything it had to be a lot of fun because I missed out. I just, sure. went, I came out of high school and, and went into pro ball and spent two and a half years in the minor leagues and I was in the big leagues. Yeah. What about your personal low? Personal low was uh, really um, letting my mother down. Oh wow! Yeah, I did not see that come. Moms, man, yeah, you, yeah. You, you, I could say the when they're disappointed in you, like yeah. that's the worst. Yeah, I mean, she, and she was she was never disappointed, but she raised me right. Yeah, and I made a choice to be a heathen and a yeah. liar, womanizer, and all the drug addict, and and she raised me right. She raised me with real principles. Yeah, she raised five of us by her, herself. She was a strong Christian woman, and you know when she when she was dying. She was dying from ter terminal breast cancer at the age of 55. Uh, she looked me in the eye one night and, and, and said, pray for me. Mm. And, and I did pray for her. And she says, you know, she says, God spoke to me. She says, God said he's going to get it out of you. And she says, you're going to go through it, but he's going to get it out of you. Oh, wow. Yeah. Kind of prophetic. Yeah. And then we, after she passed away, you know, my sister found a journal under her bed and she had been writing to God and praying over all our lives. And she was praying that God would knock me off my throne oh, wow. and that he would save me. She wasn't concerned about my success, career. See, that's a hard prayer as a parent. Because, yeah. like, think about your own kids and think about making that prayer to say, take them down so that you can build them back up. And that's a really difficult prayer. Yeah. Uh, and that's, but that's a godly mom, man. Yeah. And it came to pass. You know, yeah, it came yeah. To pass, you know, and, and sometime when I'm like preaching and I'm telling about her and in, in, in the journal, I, I just kind of come to tears, you know, because of the fact that it, it, it was it was her, you know, praying over me. I'm, I'm a better man today because she prayed over me. She wasn't concerned about my baseball career. She wasn't concerned yeah. about my success. She was concerned about my salvation. And then I go on to get saved and I become an evangelist. And I and then I lead my whole family to the Lord. And I also lead my father that rejected me. To the Lord. Okay, that's. I was really curious about that. Like, was there there? So there was reconciliation with your dad that had put you through it when you were a kid. Yeah. yeah wow. Yeah, there was no relationship there for forever throughout my whole major league career and stuff like that. He would come to games, but he was just dad. There was not really a relationship. Then, um, you know, I just remember one day he was in the hospital in San Diego, and I was about to do a men's conference um, on a Saturday morning in California, and the Lord spoke to me on Friday night and says, "Go down and see your dad in the hospital and repent to him." Wow. That's he told you to repent to him? Yeah. Well, you're like, well, I heard you wrong, Lord. I, uh, I, like... I swear I did. I thought, <laughs> yeah. I thought he was all over me that night, too. And my, I called my wife and said, pray for me. God's all over me about going to San Diego and repent. Because he knew I had no relationship with him. Yeah. He knew I was broken. He said, I want you to go repent to him. And he goes, he goes I want you not say anything about what he did to you. I just want you what you did to him. And oh, man. you kept him out of your life. And, and, and I did. And I went down there that Sunday, and I went to see my father, and I got in the hospital. I said, you know, the Lord has changed my life, and my life has changed me different. He was like, yeah. And I says, I just need you, uh, would you forgive me for keeping you out of my life? And a tear came out of his eye, and I lost it. Oh, uh, man. I laid in his lap, and I just lost it. I just cried. You become that 8-year-old kid again, I man. don't. I, you should It was just, I just cried so hard, I lost it. And then God said, raise up. And then I raised up, and he says, now lead him in the center of prayer. I said, would you like to accept the Lord? My life has changed. And he said, yes. And I led him in the center of prayer. He accepted the Lord. And he, he passed away about five, six months ago after that. And wow. I just remember God saying, how dare you not forgive him, and I forgave you. And he was telling me about the forgiveness. The forgiveness was not for your father. The forgiveness was for me. Man. No wonder I stayed broken for so long. Yeah. He said, those that do not forgive will stay broken on the inside. They will never. They will never be able to feel my presence because forgiveness is forgiveness comes from Him. Yeah. You know, and I think a lot of us miss that, and I missed that for so long, and I was immediately released from my father. You know, 
burdens and hatred and pain and whatever. We didn't go on to have a relationship, but I was released from that, from when that day I did that with God. And, sure. and I was free. I was free forever. I, I, I just had never felt that freedom, man. And I was just like, I, I was driving home and I was just like crying. And it was just so crazy. My brother was with me and he was just like watching me and he was crying too. And I was just crying and God was just like ministering to me. And and he wanted me to remember one thing. He says, I need you to remember one thing. It's never about you. Right. Well, you talked about like the back to the basics. If you're in that slump religiously, faith wise, go back to the basics. And what is the basics? Love God, love people, you know, and like and part of that is making amends and, and you know, forgiving because you're right. The forgiveness that we extend to somebody changes us Yeah, it, as, as much as it does. It, maybe it's something sometimes it doesn't even work for them. Sometimes they don't even want it. Right. But boy, it can set you free as well. And we, we don't even we don't even know that until we actually do it. Exactly. You know, because we think, well, why should? I, you know, yeah. had I not, you know, you know, had I not listened to God that night on that Friday night, because I was going to do an immense ministry on Saturday morning. So why this was wasn't until Sunday, yeah. you know, but I knew he had spoke to me, you know, and it was like, this is nothing to play with. Well, it's good that you followed through with it, though, because I could see debating that. Like, no. I could see, like, I didn't hear you right. You I, I debated it for years. Yeah, I you get know, that. And, and, and that's why he said that's why I was never, that's why I was never free. You know, because we don't get free because we we won't release. You know, something that is out of our control, which was way out of my control for him to be the way he was, and don't know why he was like that. And you know, you find out why he was like that after he, after later on in life that his father was an alcoholic and his father beat the crap out of his mother right in front of him. Yeah, and, and he so was the, the only cycle. child. Yeah, you know, and you find out that, and you goes. Well, there it is. Yeah, it all checks out. But the good news is, through the grace of God, you broke that cycle. Broke the cycle. Yeah, yeah. and broke that's the Broke the cycle with my kids and never never put a hand on them. Yeah. Because I, I, me and my brother used to speak when we were young like that. And I said, when I get kids, I'm never going to do I'm sure. never going to do them like this. I'm never going to touch them. Yeah. Because I, it left me it left me with scars and, and wounds. And, and the problem is, with most of us, we're so ashamed to show our scars and wounds why are we so afraid? And Jesus showed his, us his scars and wounds. Sure, you know it's just, it, it 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 doesn't dawn on me why we as people here. Well, I don't want anybody to know I've been through something. Well, because it's the judgment. I think it's the fear of that, and that 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 holds us back. Because the minute I let this go, and and you see that I don't have it all together, then it gets <laughs> lopped back on. And it gets weaponized. I, I see it happen all the time inside I, of church and faith, and it's difficult. I know, and, but I but I'm glad that I'm an open book. Yeah, you know, because I want to help so many people, and my mother left a legacy for us when she was dying, and she died right in front of us. And I looked her in the eyes and I said, "Mom, it's okay to release, let mm -hmm. go. You know, you can release and let it go." And she was just looking and looking, and she looked at the girls. She looked back at me. I said, "You can let go. We're gonna be all right." And she let go. Wow. And the legacy was she left with us that Jesus is Lord. There you go. And you're carrying that on, carrying it on in your book, Turn Your Season Around, How God Transforms Your Life. Uh, Daryl, I appreciate you, you know, taking the time to sit down and, and, and be an open book uh, with us today. Thank you, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching this episode of Can I Ask You Something? We're working on more videos of personal stories and expert opinions that help you apply your faith in all of life circumstances. Way Nation is a crowdfunded nonprofit that creates fun and meaningful blogs and videos and podcasts that give you a confident and joyful faith. You can see all of our work and lend your support at waynation.com.